Hey there, Slashaholics. Before we start tonight, I want to say a big thank you to all the patrons of this channel, because without them, the channel would simply not exist. So, a very big thank you to Jay Gardner, Michael Clark, The Jersey Devil, Jason Epstein, Alex Vanover, Carl of Cthulhu, Chris Dozier, Cinerenic CAX, EXC3LS10R84, Gucci Solo, Iron Alexa, Jackson Smith, Jordan Nicholson, Callie Gamer Girl 82, Catherine McClear, Katie Sabo, Kodo Bukia, Transformers Bishoho, Marshall Jenkins, Morgan Cherney, Nick Valcarve, Peyton Loeb, William Schaefer, Yusuf McRae, Alvaro M., Jacob Hill, Jeremy Wilson, Casey Hawaii, Liam Anderson, Scar, Donovan Shelton, EGSCW, Landon Turner, Mr. D. Authier, Nick, and Serpentrope. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you. And if anybody listening would like to help support the channel to keep it going and growing for years to come, please consider joining our Patreon, making a PayPal or Cash App donation, or even ordering a Cameo video. All the information and links to do any of these is in the description and pinned comment below. We can't monetize the channel here on YouTube, so we really depend on Slashaholics like you to keep the channel going. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Interlude 4 from the Journal of Pamela Voorhees, October 31st, 1957. It's been one month and 19 days since they let my Jason drown. One month and 19 of the blackest days of my life. The doctors and nurses at the hospital said they were ever so sorry. Winnie from up the road held me while I cried. She said she knew how I, how I felt, but she doesn't. No one can possibly know unless they have outlived their child. Even worse, I don't even have a grave to visit because they've buried an empty pine box. Jason's body was never recovered from the lake. I have no closure, only endless pain. I am in hell. Therefore, I thought, why not seek hell's aid? I've known about Elias' book for years now. I read his journal entries about the ritual he conducted to give us Jason. I've read his notes on translating the book's runes and believe I can do it myself. It's October the 31st, All Hallows' Eve. Samhain, Halloween, the perfect night to converse with demons and devils. I care not what they are or what their nature is. I only care about what they might return to me. Don't worry, my sweet, sweet boy. Mommy will make everything all right again. First, I will bring you back, and then we will punish all those irresponsible bitches and whoremasters at that camp. Oh, yes, they will pay dearly for what they did to you. Mommy will see to everything. Later, a huge harvest moon hung over the horizon, casting its orange jack-o'-lantern glow over the lake. I performed the ritual described in the book on the shore near where my Jason drowned. There was a hunting knife in a pouch at my belt in case someone from the camp should discover me. I must confess that I hoped someone would. A bit of human blood might have strengthened the incantation. Alas, no one came. I completed the ritual and then waited. I waited until the sun rose above the top of the trees, and the trumpet blew the morning wake-up blast over the sleeping camp. Jason didn't come. I didn't see a ripple or bubble. I didn't feel the wind pick up or hear strange voices whisper in my ear. How did I fail where my bastard husband succeeded? Maybe the entities enjoy my torment far too much to grant me a favor? Perhaps they sit back and watch me sob into my pillow each night and drink my salty tears like wine. I don't know. What I do know is that my life is ended. Though I am not brave enough to force my body to stop its senseless working, I am pathetic. So I go on, listlessly moving through a world that has lost all color. Jason, my sweet baby boy, I think I know a way to bring color back to the world. I will go to the camp and carve up anyone responsible for what happened to you and anyone who tries to keep that place open. 
I will paint the world red, Jason. I will paint everything with their hot blood. For you, my sweet Jason. All for you. Mommy loves you. Chapter 13 Two Boys Fight for Their Girl The hot water cascaded down Jessica's back, nearly scalding her, cleaning away the day's grime. It was too bad it couldn't wash away her grief. A sob escaped her lips, her tears lost in the falling water. She rubbed at her eyes, trying to quiet herself, but another sob came through regardless. Her pain was hungry, and it would not be denied. She longed to be held to shift some of her load to another and take comfort, but she couldn't even do that because Robert wasn't home. She tried to call his cell phone before jumping in the shower, and he hadn't answered. She had no idea where he was. Mom's gone, apparently murdered by my ex-boyfriend, and my new boyfriend is AWOL. God, I feel so alone. Maybe so, but you can't shut down. You have to pick Stephanie up by eight, so dry up your tears and get in gear. Easier said than done. She thought of Stephen, the look in his eyes when he caught sight of her and the baby at the sheriff's office. Ed was so sure he killed her mother. Ed had evidence, was a witness to Stephen standing over her mother's body. But his eyes had been kind. She pushed the thought away. She needed to start accepting the facts. The father of her child was a killer. She reached for the soap and then froze as the lights went out, plunging the bathroom into darkness. The metallic taste of fear filled her mouth, made her heart race. She turned the water off and stepped out, drying quickly and donning a t-shirt that clung to her still damp curves. Robert, she called, hating the tremulous sound of her voice. Is that you? You better not be playing games right now. I'm really not in the mood. No answer. Fear deepened towards panic. Of course, Robert wouldn't turn the lights off. He wouldn't play games with her, not now, not in the house where her mother... She stepped out into the hall and started down the stairs to the ground floor. She reached the bottom and turned left into the living room, where light from the street lights outside filtered in through the windows. So it was just her mom's house without power. So what? Hello? The flap of the sheet fastened over the shattered window was the only reply she got. Nothing else moved in the house. Or did it? The tingle at the nape of her neck told her otherwise. She needed a light. She crept out of the room and down the hall towards the garage. Memories from a happier time floated through her mind. Memories of sneaking out of the darkened house to meet Stephen on the street corner. She never thought she'd be sneaking through the house like that again. Jessica reached the door to the garage and pushed it open. The earthy scent of motor oil filled her nose. Her car was a hulking shadow in the black. She felt along the wall to her left, her hand falling on the smooth wooden handle of a claw hammer hung on a pegboard. She lifted the hammer, reassured by its weight, and then followed the edge of the car to the driver's side door. She opened it and climbed inside. She leaned over to rummage through her glove box and her foot brushed the brake pedal. Red light flared, illuminated khaki pants in a dirty white shirt near the car's trunk. Jessica didn't see them. She found the flashlight and turned it on, playing the beam around her. She got out, leaving the hammer on the seat beside the car, and came face to face with Campbell. Jesus! Jessica gasped. You scared the hell out of me. Where have you been? He didn't respond, only stared, blank-eyed at her for a moment. Jessica frowned, taking in his appearance by the light of the flashlight. Something was very wrong. Both of his eyes were sunken and bruised, and blood streaked his neck and chin. Robert, you look like shit. What happened to you? He reached out with grimy hands and gripped her head hard enough to leave bruises. She pulled away, found she was caught fast in his vice-like grip. 
he opened his mouth wide, growling like an animal, and began to force his mouth onto hers. Movement to her left, the sound of running feet, and a voice raised in fury. Get away from her! It was Stephen. He punched Campbell in the face, knocking him away from her, and then he was clutching her hand and dragging her from the home. Where are you taking me? She asked as they crossed the threshold onto the front yard where Ward's car waited with the engine still running. There's no time to explain right now, he yelled, tugging on her. Come on! Jessica had had enough of men manhandling her. She planted her feet, started to slap him, and was surprised when he picked her up over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. She pounded on his back with clenched fist, struggled against his desperate hold. Let me go! Stephen, put me down right now, or I swear I'm going to kill you! They reached the car. Stephen threw the door open and stuffed Jessica unceremoniously into the front passenger seat before climbing in beside her. She looked up at his blazing face, terrified. He was going to kidnap her. That was it. He wanted her back and he wanted Stephanie. He must have thought her mother was keeping him away from them by keeping her secrets. Stephen, I don't want to go with you. Tell me what's going on. Stephen started to answer and then a fist burst through the driver's side window and grabbed for his throat. Jessica screamed as shards of glass pricked the exposed skin of her thighs, drawing blood. Stephen threw the car into reverse and jammed his foot on the gas pedal. The car lurched backwards, breaking Campbell's grip on his neck and sending the reporter rolling along the driveway. Jessica gazed out the window in horror as Stephen stopped the car. Campbell got to his feet and started towards them, unperturbed by his tumble. Stephen shifted the car into drive and sped forward. Jessica threw a hand out to grab the wheel, but she was far too late. The car hit Campbell, sending him flipping up over the hood and roof to sprawl on the ground behind them. Stephen wasted no time. He shifted into reverse and gunned the engine. The car jumped twice as it passed over Jessica's boyfriend, and then they were speeding along down a country road. Jessica looked over at him, speechless in the face of such violence. Robert is dead, she thought. She paused, waiting for the flood of fresh grief, but it didn't come. She felt numb, empty. Maybe this outrage was one too many in such a short time. No, I won't be spared this. It will hit me like a ton of bricks tonight or tomorrow and leave me a gasping husk, hollowed out and weeping to the ground. How much could one person endure before madness set in? Was it just around the corner with terrible chomping teeth? She looked to Stephen, bent over the wheel. He really was a killer. She had to get away from him. Stephen, she said, stop this car, pull over right now. There was a turnoff ahead. Stephen slammed on the brakes, and the car fishtailed to a stop near a Smokey the Bear sign, detailing their responsibility for preventing forest fires. She raised her hands, ready to fight, but stopped at the look on Stephen's face. Are you out of your mind? He shook his head, put a hand on her arm. Just listen to me for a minute, okay? What I'm going to tell you will sound insane, but I promise you I'm not crazy. Now you think I killed Robert back there, right? No way he could have lived. I mean, I ran the fucker over. Stephen. Stephen cut her off. Just tell me, did I kill him or not? Jessica nodded, eyes wide. Yes, you killed him. Wrong, Stephen said, feeling like Kyle Reese trying to convince Sarah Connor the Terminator was coming to get her. Come with me if you want to live, he thought bitterly. He is not dead, he said. And that is not Robert, Jess. I love you and I loved your mom. I did not kill her. Yesterday, Josh or, or someone that looked like Josh killed her. And that was after she blew the back of his head off with a revolver. I stabbed him through the heart with a fire poker and the son of a bitch still lived. That isn't possible. You need help. You and the baby are the only ones who need help, Jess. Not me. You are in a lot of danger and I'm here to help. Jessica scoffed. You are going to save us like some fucking hero? Even if I believed you, I would never trust you again. You are irresponsible and reckless. You always have been and always will be. You're like Peter Pan in The Lost Boys. You'll never grow up. Pain flashed through Stephen's eyes, but he bore it in silence. Finally, he nodded. You might have been right, 
when you left me all those months ago. But you aren't now. I'm not the man I used to be. I've changed. Your mom saw it. That's why I was at her house the night she died. Diana invited me over to talk. She was going to tell me about your connection to the Voorhees family. Her last words were spent asking me to protect you from Jason. Madness, she thought as she leaned against the passenger door. He's utterly insane. Stephen turned back to the wheel, shifted the car into drive. Let's go get the baby. He really means to go get Stephanie. Jessica blinked and found herself lunging towards him, her fist raised. She brought it down on his groin, and he cried out. You killed my mother, and you think I'd let you near my baby? She shouted. She grabbed him by the back of his head and rammed his face into the steering wheel, drawing blood. She reached past him, opened the door, and shoved him out onto the ground. Stay away from me! Jess! Stephen yelled. He got to his knees, clung to the car door. Wait! Jess! Fuck you, she said, slamming her foot on the gas pedal. Stephen held for a second and then fell away. She pulled out onto the pavement and sped away. Stephen was a crumpled heap in the dust that quickly receded into the night. Chapter 14 Old Friends Sheriff Ed Landis looked up from a stack of papers at the sound of raised voices and stood when he caught sight of Jessica storming towards his office door, followed by two of his deputies. She was in a bad way, dressed only in a t-shirt and frantic. He met her at the door and she collapsed into him, burying her face in his chest. Ed, she said, I just left Stephen out on Lake Road. He killed Robert. Jesus, he thought, not another one. Freeman's getting as bad as Jason. How many more bodies will he leave in his wake before he's satisfied? He patted Jessica on the back and then leaned away from her so he could see her face. Hey now, slow down. No, you aren't listening to me. Stephen ran him over. Are you all right? Jessica nodded. I'm fine. I was staying at my mom's place when Stephen showed up talking crazy. Did he hurt you? Landis asked. Jessica groaned with frustration. Surely the sheriff wasn't that slow. He didn't hurt me. He hurt Robert. Okay, he said. I hear you. You said you left him out on Lake Road. Where exactly? She frowned, trying to remember. I I'm not sure. There was a Smokey the Bear sign on the side of the road. I know where that is, Deputy Dill said helpfully. That's out past the old Myers place. Landis hugged Jessica, whispered, It's okay. You are safe now. Don't you worry. He lifted his head to address the two deputies. Have dispatch notify all available units. I want this kid. <coughs> the sound of tires on gravel brought Stephen back from the dark. He tasted dirt and blood. Everything hurt. He sat up groaning and looked to see a deputy sheriff cruiser pull to a stop in front of him with its red and blue bubble lights flashing. The driver's door slammed open and a tall figure emerged. Randy's words from earlier occurred to him. They'll shoot you on sight if you escape. Shit, he breathed, getting to his feet with his hands raised over his head. Don't shoot! The figure emerged from the obscuring lights and Stephen relaxed, lowering his arms. It was Randy. Stephen started to speak and then Randy's fist met his jaw, stopping words and knocking him to the ground. Damn it, Randy said, walking in a circle, clutching his throbbing hand. Stephen rose to a crouch, wiping fresh blood from his lips. He eyed Randy, anger boiling in his chest. Fuck this, he said, charging forward. He tackled Randy around the middle and sent him flipping across the cruiser's hood into the dirt. The deputy landed hard and rolled onto his back. Great, Stephen thought. I think I went too far. This and breaking out of the jail earlier? I'm going to have to take Randy fishing to patch things up after this shit is all over. Stephen walked over to his friend, put a hand on his shoulder. Are you okay? Randy rounded on Stephen and dragged him to the ground, kicking and screaming. They rolled over and over, throwing punches. They came up on their knees, grabbed each other's shoulders, and headbutted each other. Ouch, dude! 
Stuff it up your ass, Randy gasped, leaning back against the cruiser. Get in the fucking car. Stephen leaned beside him, his chest heaving. You get in the car. Randy shifted his weight and pulled a set of handcuffs from a pouch on his belt. Do you want me to cuff you? What makes you think you can? Randy's free hand moved to his belt and came to rest on the handle of the new pistol holstered at his hip. I got a gun? Stephen spat blood into the dirt beside him and pulled a pistol of his own from his waistband. Fuck that, I got a gun! Each eyed the other for a moment and then both brandished the firearms, the barrel swaying wildly. You totally wrecked Jessica, Randy said. Stephen's brow furrowed and he lowered his gun an inch. Jessica? You've seen Jessica? Yes, I've seen her. She's at the station scared half to death. The choice was easy. He needed to be where Jessica was. Stephen tossed his gun away and held out his hands, wrists together. Cuff me. Randy was speechless. What? What? Cuff me, Stephen repeated. I've been a bad boy. I've beaten a deputy's ass twice today. Take me to jail and lock me up. Randy stood and holstered his weapon, eyebrow raised. I wouldn't say you beat my ass. This was taking too long. A second ago, Randy was willing to shoot him to get him in the car. Now all he wanted to do was argue about who was the tougher swinging dick. Stephen shoved his hands under Randy's nose and pointed to the restraints. Are you going to put those on me, or should I take them and do it myself? Randy stared for a moment and then snapped the cuffs in place. Stephen nearly led the deputy to the cruiser's rear door, eager to be near Jessica before it was too late. He was afraid he'd already lost too much time. Chapter 15 At the Sheriff's Office Sheriff Ed Landis hung up the phone with a satisfied look on his tired face. He would have Stephen back under his thumb in five minutes' time and would be able to start getting the whole insane situation back under control. He looked over to the battered old couch, nestled against one wall, where Jessica sat perched on the edge of the cushion with Deputy Ryan beside her. Ryan had her arm around Jessica, trying to comfort, but it appeared to be doing very little. Jessica was like a live wire, trembling with nervous energy. Ed felt like crying again. He cleared his throat and crossed over to the two women. Randy just picked Stephen up, he said, helping Jessica to her feet. He's bringing him in now. Listen, why don't you go with Deputy Ryan? She'll get you some clothes. All we have are deputy uniforms, Ryan said apologetically. Will that be okay? Jessica nodded. Anything is fine, I'm grateful. Ryan put a hand on Jessica's shoulder and led her from the office towards the nearest locker room. Jason strode into the sheriff's office lobby like a prowling lion, driving his Robert Campbell meat suit beyond its limits. He could feel muscle cords tightened like guitar strings twisted to the points of rupture. This body was strong, but it would not last long at the rate he was going. Already, it had taken damage thanks to the meddling man in glasses. He has balked us twice now, said the voices in his head. You cannot allow him to interfere again. You must pay him back in kind. Rip the skin from his living bones while he screams. Yes, my sweet Jason, mother said. Listen to them. They are our friends. They will help make you whole again. One man sat behind the long desk that ran the length of the lobby. The sign on the wall behind him said the booking area was through the door to the man's left. There, said the voices. She's through there. We feel her presence. The deputy's name was Johnson. The man looked up at the sound of Jason's approach and his eyes went wide when he saw the blood and tire marks across Jason's chest. He stood and came around the desk, hand out to stop Jason. Damn, dude, Johnson said. You look like hammered shit. Are you okay? Jason grabbed the weak man by the wrist and flung him across the room with enough force to tear his shoulder from its socket. Johnson's head struck the wall with a meaty crunch, caving in the drywall and his skull. 
Jason moved past the quivering body and through the door into the bullpen where rows of desks marched away towards the rear of the room. Two figures were exiting another door, one female deputy, the other dressed in a white t-shirt and deputy pants and boots. Jason felt his black heart quicken. Yes, the voices chorused. We have her now. Jason charged forward and took Deputy Ryan by the back of her head, entwining his fingers into her hair. Ryan opened her mouth to scream and then Jason rammed her head into the lockers, shattering her face like a porcelain plate. Jessica spun away to flee, but Jason was faster. He grabbed her ponytail and swung her into the bloody lockers, pinning her with his body. He had her. It was time. He forced her jaws open with gore-encrusted fingers and leaned forward, the worm thrusting past his lips. A hand fell on his shoulder and pulled him back. Jason turned to see the old sheriff bringing a revolver to bear. The man was slow. He was weak. He stood no chance. Jason whipped his hand out and palm healed Landis in the nose. Blood sprayed in a great gout and the man went down. No, Ed! Jessica screamed. She reared back and drove her elbow into Jason's sternum. He stumbled back a step, grunting as bones broken by Stephen's car grated against each other. That's nothing, Mother said. Keep going. Don't let her get away. He wouldn't. Jason followed, hot on her heels. Stephen walked along the hallway beside Randy, running his tongue over a newly loosened tooth in his mouth. He had to give it to Randy. The man could throw a decent punch. Not quite good enough to keep Stephen down, but better than most that Stephen had scuffled with. They rounded a corner and were met by the sounds of heavy breathing and running feet. Stephen looked up and saw Jessica sprint around the corner, with Campbell right behind her. Campbell caught her, slammed her against the wall. Jessica saw Stephen and began to scream, Stephen, help me! Later, when he had time to consider, Stephen would think he had never moved so fast. He leapt into the air, jumping through the handcuffed chains as if they were a jump rope and getting his hands in front of him. Beside him, Randy still hadn't reacted to the scene before them. Stephen reached out and drew Randy's pistol from its holster and then elbowed the deputy in the chin. Randy crumpled to the floor like a damp dish towel and was still. Get the fuck off me, Jessica shouted. She kneed Campbell in the stomach hard enough to push him back. And then she scrambled forward, bent low. Stephen didn't waste a second. He raised the pistol and squeezed the trigger over and over again. Six shots found Campbell's chest, knocking him back. He struck the wall at the end of the hallway and bounced off, but he did not go down. Black blood ran down the wall in rivulets to puddle on the tile floor. Campbell glared at Stephen and then at Jessica, huddled behind him. He would not be thwarted a third time by this man. He took a step forward and Stephen fired again. The seventh bullet flew true, striking Campbell in the center of his forehead. Brains and bits of bone struck the wall as Campbell finally went down. Stephen felt trembling fingers grip his arm, and he turned to see Jessica, speaking words he couldn't hear over the ringing in his ears. He watched her lips as she repeated, Is he dead? Stephen looked back at Campbell's still form, remembering all the damage that the thing inside him had absorbed during its time inside Josh, and shook his head. We have to go, he said, taking her hand in his free one. They sprinted away, up the passage, through the bullpen, and out towards the front lobby. <laughs> 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 
Deputy Watson sprinted along the hall towards the gunfire, his pistol in hand and his heart in his throat. This was real. This wasn't writing speeding tickets or rousting a drunk from the local bar. This was life and death, balls to the wall police work, and Watson was scared shitless. This is a small town, man, sure. There's been an occasional mass murder in the woods over the years, but most of that was well before my time. I didn't sign up to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a fucking armed gunman. He gripped his gun tighter, his stomach roiling, and he began to fear that he might soil his pants. Don't worry, man, he thought. No one would be able to see. You wore the brown pants. A door opened in front of him, and deputies Deal and Hanson charged into the hall. Watson slowed his pace to ensure they got well ahead of him. He damn sure wasn't going to be the first one around the next corner. Officer down, Hanson shouted as he and Deal caught sight of Randy's sprawled form on the floor. Hanson knelt and checked the unconscious deputy's vitals. He's breathing. Let's check the other one. Watson stopped by Randy, watching as Deal and Hanson approached the bloody figure at the end of the hallway. The deputies went to their knees, reached to check Campbell's pulse. Campbell sat up, quick as grease lightning, and slammed Hanson's and Deal's heads together. Cracking their craniums like eggs, they fell away dead. Watson stared in shock as the ghastly man stood to study him. He was a walking wound. He should not be able to draw breath, much less stand or move. All-encompassing terror washed over him, and Watson fled. He took a door off the corridor and ran down a flight of stairs, taking them two at a time. He reached the bottom, sure that he heard the monster close behind. He turned into the cell block. A large fist shot out between the cell bars and struck his temple with tremendous force. Watson wilted to the floor and did not move. <laughs> Creighton Duke laughed. Bitch. The bounty hunter donned his cowboy hat and retrieved a set of keys from the down deputy's belt. It was time to mosey on. There was important work to do, and he had to make sure all the pieces were in place. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Interlude 4, this time Pamela's journal entry, which I thought was great, and also chapters 13, 14, and 15 of Jason Goes to Hell, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Jeremy is knocking this one out of the park. Uh, I love Jason Goes to Hell myself and Jason X. I know that's not a popular opinion, but I've seen comments from people saying that they hate the movie, but they're loving the novelization. I think having a little more insight into the characters and the lore and all of that really helps this story. Um, I love what Adam Marcus did, you know, with, with his script and directing Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, he, he took the franchise and gave it some lore and some backstory and, you know, it still felt like a Friday the 13th film at its core. Uh, you had some great deaths. Sure, the body jumping thing was new and weird for some people, um, but it's fun. The Jason Goes to Hell is never not fun, and the same thing can be said for this novelization. I can only imagine, you know, what's going through Jessica's head when Steven shows up. I totally understand, you know, as, as listeners, readers, or viewers of the movie, you know, we're screaming, oh my god, just shut up and listen to him, but you gotta put yourself in her shoes. All the stuff that's happened, what she believes is happening, and she has no reason to doubt what, you know, what she's seen and heard from everybody else. So, in her mind, Steven's a psycho killer now, and even though she dated him for years and should know he's not that kind of person, all the evidence is saying otherwise. And sometimes that can be compelling enough. Um, I love that Landis goes out the way he did. I guess he got his nose bone shoved up in his brain. Um, you know, Jessica got a rude awakening when she found out Steven wasn't lying. 
Um, you know, Stephen could have at any point used that gun to try to force her to go with him, and he didn't, so respect there. Uh, him and Randy, <laughs> their whole scene is a lot of fun. Just, you know, I live in a small town, so I know what it's like for, like, uh, there was somebody I went to high school with that was the cop in town. We had, we had one cop for a while. And uh, so I know what that dynamic can kind of be like. Uh, so that it's pretty cool to see their scene, get a little more insight into them. Um, Jason showing up at the police station uh, in, in Robert's body, one of the coolest scenes in the movie, outside of maybe the diner. I do like that one too, even though we lose a couple characters that I really like. Um you know, Joey and her husband and everything, but, uh, and especially their son. I hate that their son has to die. Um, spoiler alert, if you haven't ever seen the movie and, uh, you're listening to the audiobook, my bad. Um, but yeah, so Jason went to the jail, killed a shit ton of people. I guess Randy's lucky to be unconscious when it happens, uh, so he doesn't even register on Jason's radar, but Creighton Duke is unleashed. Steven and Jessica are on the run to get their baby. And uh, we're heading into the final stretch of this book, and I'm very excited to uh, to present it to you. Jeremy's doing an amazing job. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, you can read the ebook uh, right now on the Patreon. Uh, I believe Jeremy's going to release it everywhere after the audiobook's done. But uh, if you are a, a patron of the channel, uh, as one of the perks of that is to enjoy early access to the ebook before it's released uh, all over the internet. Um, not charging, we're not charging you for the ebook. It's just something that we're offering. Uh, it's available to read there, you know, if you're a supporter of the channel or if you want to support the channel. Um, it's just a little, little gift. Um, but I'll be back very soon with hopefully the conclusion of Jason Goes to Hell. There's only one, maybe two uploads left of this book before it's finished. Let us know what you think in the comments below of this book so far. Give Jeremy a shout out, you know, maybe a thank you for bringing these books to life. Uh, he did Child's Play 1 before this one. And I think he's got a really cool idea for an original Michael Myers meets uh, Leatherface uh, adventure coming up with an original novel for the channel. Alright, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and remember... The sun never sets on those who ride into it. See you soon.